Well, thank you, Sam. It's a great pleasure to be here at Yale. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and to be with all of you fellow teachers, and we we're all in this kind of same thing together. Um, and yeah, I mean, the connection with India, Sam mentioned this, or I mentioned it, Sam says that I might remind all of you if you don't happen to know. Yale University was established by Elihu Yale, who was the governor of Madras, India, in the early 1600s, around 1638, something like that. Uh, he establishes Yale University, named it after himself, uh, <laughs> shamelessly, uh, after having spent a career of kind of milking the, the profits out of India from East India Company to kind of atone for that, I think, he, he established a, a university. So there's a connection with Yale and India that goes back several centuries. And that itself is fascinating. Um, the, but the, the, the story of Islam in India, which is what uh, my particular interest is, as, as Sam mentioned, I, I lived two years in the Peace Corps in Iran, and uh, I made a, uh, a, a f very important, lucky trip to India while I was in Iran. Uh, I had already learned Persian, and so I was already kind of, and I already spent a year living in Tabriz, Iran, and I became kind of uh, uh, sensitized to Islamic culture, uh, Persian culture. And then I go to India, and I thought India was all Hindu. That's all, that was my sense. I just, I, all the textbooks kind of said that's what I, did. I didn't expect to find uh, s such a profound influence of both Iranian and Islamic influence in South Asia. And in a sense, my whole career has been trying to kind of work that out. You know, how did Islam become so deeply uh, invested in and sink such deep roots uh, in this very different culture, this Hindu-Buddhist uh, culture? Uh, this is back in the 60s when I made that trip, 63 to be exact. And uh, I look around and I see this architecture that clearly looks like Isfahan. You know, anyone who goes to the Taj Mahal bang, and you realize these were Persian architects. Uh, you look at the script of Urdu, it's Persian script. Uh, you listen to music, yeah, you look at the clothing, you look at the, and you begin to learn vocabulary, it's all Persian. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And so this whole connection between Iran and India, uh, these two powerful civilizations, and the religious component, Islam and the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain traditions of South Asia, and how they interact has been a, uh, a fascinating question that I'm still kind of trying to sort out. Um, just to kind of heads up, a couple of major books that I want to, I wrote them on the board. I don't have any, any handout, I apologize for that. But here are some books that I think are really uh, leading books to give a general survey of Islam in South Asia. Francis Robinson. An Englishman uh, has a, got a number of books. His book, Islam and Muslim History in South Asia, is a, is a classic, Oxford 2000. Uh, Carl Ernst uh, writes a lot on Sufism, and I know you've been reading and, and, and hearing a lot about that. It's a major story here. Um, a book entitled Eternal Garden, uh, Mysticism, History, and Politics at a South Asian Sufi Center. Uh, it's a, it's a very important and very accessible study. Uh, all these are, I hope. I edited a book called India's Islamic Traditions. It came out in 2000. Uh, and that's a series of essays written by scholars coming from different perspectives who are collectively uh, trying to understand you know, what, what kinds of traditions, literary, artistic, uh, historical, legal, uh, there's a whole range of, of things that, that uh, one can talk about, uh, and uh, that is historically oriented from 711 to 1750. And then finally, Anna Marie Schimmel, uh, Islam in the Indian subcontinent. She, the German scholar, uh, <coughs> one of the uh, leading scholars of, of, of South Asian Islam, um, and that, again, a very accessible book there. So what I'm going to do is kind of give up a, 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 hopefully, about a 45-minute uh, overall presentation here, but uh, I, I invite questions if they are, of, you know, to, to, to clarify a point that may not be clear, but don't, don't be bashful about asking. And then afterwards, uh, we'll have a, about 20 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes of, of general questioning to, to kind of move into more, a more substantive nature. Now, where to begin? 
Well, I always begin with a map. And this map is loaded with important information because it, what it does, it's based on the 1931 census. Now, the 1931 census was the last really good census the British did in India. You know, they started these decennial censuses in the, in the 1800s. I think 1871 uh, was the first they did. And then every 10 years, they, they did a census of India to find out who, who was here. And uh, this, and the 31 was the last really good one. 1941, of course, England was otherwise preoccupied, to put it mildly. Uh, and so we don't really have a, they, they weren't, because they were fighting the war, uh, they, they, that's not really all that good a, uh, a census. And then, of course, after that, you have independent South Asia. In 1951, you have India and Pakistan. But you can already see the map of Pakistan and Bangladesh kind of, um, uh, uh, present even before the two states emerge uh, because you have a predominant Muslim population in eastern Bengal but not western Bengal, western Punjab but not eastern Punjab, and where's my pointer? Here's what I got. Yeah, this is great. Uh, I think this is it here in the, in the uh, yeah, there you go. This is all the Punjab. West Punjab is predominantly Muslim. You get up to, what, 75 percent, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent Muslims in the western Punjab, but not the east. And conversely, in, in Bengal, uh, the, the eastern portion is mainly Muslim, but not the western. Uh, very few Muslims in the heart of the highlands of central India, but then the Deccan you get in the south, you get some more. So one of the questions that's always kind of animated my own research is how do you explain this uneven distribution of Muslims in South Asia. Especially given the fact that South Asia is home to one-third of the world's Muslim population. That's more, more Muslims are in South Asia than there are in the Middle East. That's a shocking, not by, not by much, it's a, it's a, it's a close race. Um, but. It's amazing to think about that. You know, after Indonesia, which is the world's largest Muslim population, uh, the next two, India, uh, next three, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and they're all very close, very similar populations, somewhere around th three or four hundred million, uh, each one of them. And you add those together, uh, and you begin to realize that South Asia, in terms of demography, really is the center of gravity of the Muslim world. Um, this is a jarring fact because we've always been taught to believe that you know, the Middle East is somehow the, the heartland of Islam. Historically, of course, that's obviously true. But the area where it sunk its roots demographically in terms of uh, the Muslim population, uh, it really is South Asia. And so this is the, and, and then, then you look at the map and you ask, well, why is it that the Western, the Northwestern, and the far eastern Bengal, and to some extent the Deccan, how is it that those areas became most receptive to Islam? I'm going to try to present some, some answers to that uh, this morning, as well as some remarks about the nature of Islamic uh, piety and how it differs or compares with Islam elsewhere in the Muslim world. And again, feel free to uh, raise any questions uh, as we move along. Um, historically, we go back to the seventh century. I know that Dick Bullitt uh, has already uh, talked about the Umayyad and, and the uh, Abbasid periods. Uh, so suffice it to say that this is the period that, where Islam first uh, encounters uh, Western India, Sindh in particular, the province of Sindh where the Indus River uh, empties into the Arabian Sea. And it happens in, actually in 711 is when Muhammad bin Qasim, uh, who was a general uh, under the uh, Umayyad Caliph, uh, conquers the lower Indus area, which is now Karachi area in, in southern Pakistan. And that's a very important moment in terms of the interaction with Islam in, in South Asia. Uh, this is the Arab Dao. Uh, these are the vehicles that were and they haven't, by the way, these haven't changed in about a thousand years. I actually sailed on one of these across the Arabian Sea. Uh, they still make these things in, in India as well as East Africa. Uh, these were the vessels that have traditionally been used connecting uh, the Middle East, at least the maritime uh, connection between the Middle East and South Asia. 
and uh, you can't really understand the settlement of Muslims in along the western coast of India uh, without understanding the trade routes uh, which undergird the contact between the, uh, the, the, the Persian Gulf area and, and India. Uh, okay, so here is a map showing you what basically happens. As I said, in the year 711, uh, Sindh is conquered by, this, uh, uh, by a Muslim general who establishes the area very briefly. Uh, several important legacies I, I want to just briefly mention. Juridically, in terms of law, uh, very significantly, uh, Muhammad bin Qasim, the, the, the conqueror of, of, uh, uh, of Sindh, ruled that Hindus and Buddhists will be treated as zimis, which is to say, people of the book. Now that might be jarring itself, because we think, you know, Islam understands itself as, you know, a religion of the book. The book being, obviously, the, the Torah and the Gospels, as well as the Quran. The Quran is simply a restatement of these earlier attempts to get God's message through to the people. So it's easy to imagine how Jews and Christians are already included in this larger category of people of the book. But what do we say about Hindus and Buddhists? The ruling that Indians would be juridically defined as people of the book means that already there is a stretching of the idea of book, <laughs> uh, which is to say administrators, governors, the very first governor, Muslim governor, Arab governor in India was, was accommodating himself to the reality that, uh, that we, I mean, we're a thin ruling class, we need, to, uh, we need to accommodate ourselves to the fact that, 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 that we, to, to rule these people we need to include them in this larger category which had already been uh, worked out by uh, uh, jurists. And uh, we have a tradition of a liberal juridical understanding of India from the very beginning. Um, also, Brahmins, the priests of India, were kind of reconfirmed as the elite community uh, by Muhammad bin Qasim. Uh, and uh, so there was no effort, in other words, to upset or transform the social order. Rather, the first Muslims in India uh, were there, they understood their mission as being to kind of confirm the existing social order, which is to say to confirm the caste system. All this is important because subsequent regimes, Muslim regimes in India, look back to this first founding encounter as a precedent for how in the real world uh, Indians can be governed. Uh, because obviously Muslims were, as a ruling class, a very thin, tiny um, a minority among a vast sea of, of non-Muslims. Um, and there's a brief comment about agriculture, which I, it's, it's always fascinating to me to think that, you know, we, we always hear about the, the so-called Colombian exchange of, of, of uh, plants and animals across the Atlantic Ocean since Columbus crossed it. But there was an earlier agricultural exchange across the Indian Ocean uh, when the Arabs conquered India, they brought back with them uh, a, a whole range of crops which totally transformed the, the uh, agricultural landscape of the Middle East. Uh, cotton, lemon, lime, orange, sugar, uh, all of these of course are, are either Arabic or Sanskrit and the, the words come from that, they tell their own story, uh, but much more. Uh, uh, certain strands of wheat uh, and rice uh, were transplanted in the Middle East from uh, monsoon Asia. So uh, the, the diet of the Roman world, uh, the Byzantine world more precisely, was radically transformed uh, uh, as a result of this encounter with, with India. Um, the Abbasid period uh, sees a, a kind of a withdrawal uh, beyond the Indus River. Uh, from 1750 to 1258. Uh, uh, um, the real encounter with Islam in India uh, happens not by Arabs, but by Turkic groups who had been migrating from East Asia into the West along the Silk Road connecting China uh, with the Eastern Mediterranean. And the area that is of particular interest is this area of Khorasan and Central Asia, right up here in the, um, where I put the circle, Bukhara, Samarkand, uh, these areas in the Oxus River region. This area 
in the 10th and 11th centuries was undergoing a dramatic um, cultural renaissance in the sense that you had the Iranian peoples conquered by the Arabs in the mid uh, 7th century. And about 300 years later, that submerged Iranian culture kind of bubbles up to the surface. And when it reappears, it reappears uh, in, a, in a form that has assimilated itself with, uh, with, uh, with Arab culture. Sort of the Arabic script now replaces the old Persian script. Uh, many Arabic words, loan words, are assimilated into the Persian uh, language. Uh, and in fact, modern Persian derives from this moment. Uh, it's also this place in this time that um, uh, political ideas, the status of the sultan uh, as a, uh, a non-religious leader uh, emerges uh, in this Persian Renaissance period of the 10th and 11th and 12th centuries in Khorasan, this area that I'm that's circled. Uh, the caliph of Islam is becoming progressively weaker uh, in the in the t 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. And as that happens, the sultan uh, kind of replaces the caliph, at least as a as a political uh, leader. And this is important because the idea of the sultan uh, acquires a certain notion of of someone who is above religion. Uh, he's a ruler of all peoples because Khorasan, this area, was not just Muslim. Uh, it was, of course, there were Shi'is, there were Sunnis, uh, but there were also Buddhists there, uh, large Jewish population, very large Christian population, and Nestorian Christians were there, uh, Shaman uh, Turkish population. In other words, you had a variety of different peoples in Khorasan uh, in the 9th, 10th, and 11th century. Uh, kind of cooking up this this idea of a of a secular uh, Islamic regime where religion and state are have a de facto separation, um, and of course Persian language is as I said invented at this time. It's always struck me as fascinating that you know we always talk about how English language uh, emerged about 300 years after. Uh, the Norman Conquest of 1066. You get 300 years later, you get Chaucer. Another couple hundred years, you get Shakespeare, uh, where English and French have kind of merged after th 300 years after that conquest. Same thing happens with Persian. About 300 years after the Arab conquest of Iran, uh, this synthesis of Arabic and Persian takes place, and it happens uh, in this area. Um, then. Turks begin to move into North India, and they carry this hybridized culture with them. Uh, the 1030 uh, is, the, is, the, is the date of the Mahmud of Ghazni, a Turkish uh, general, who makes these raids. And these arrows are, are indicating raids of India. Uh, uh, he's sacking temples in order to acquire wealth to mobilize uh, to create a larger sultanate uh, to the west, because this the Khorasan, this area to the west, was what was a kind of the prize. India was only used as a kind of a source of wealth uh, in the in the uh, 11th century. It's not till the 12th and 13th century that we begin to get settlement of of Turks moving down these migration corridors, and that's the term I would use to describe uh, these 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 routes. Uh, oops, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, what am I doing? Go back here. Yeah. The term I would use is a migration corridor. These are actually uh, routes, old trade routes, bringing horses and silver into India. India has always been deficient in two things. Uh, horses don't do well in India because there's a competition for land. Uh, by, by peasant population, uh, plus the, there's no grassland uh, that, as you have in Central Asia. So there's a constant need to, to import war horses by all dynasties of India. And secondly, there's no silver mines in India. So India has an old history of exporting textiles, importing uh, silver and war horses. And so these roads that connect Samarkand and Bukhara and Central Asia with South Asia are basically trade routes moving down into Lahore, from Lahore to Delhi, and from Delhi east down the Gangetic Plain toward Bengal, as well as south into Gujarat and from there into the Deccan Plateau. Um, and these migration corridors, while they're commercial, 
Uh, they are also, um, <coughs> let me go back to that, oh yeah. They are also important because they, they facilitate the migration of, of large populations who are being moved out of Central Asia because of the Mongols. And when this happens, uh, now we get a true um, a Turco, a Turkish kind of Muslim population migrating into, into India. Uh, Delhi becomes filled up with populations of, of, of transplanted immigrants who are fleeing uh, the terror of the Mongol uh, invasions of, of Central Asia. Uh, and when they come, uh, they arrive with a sense of authority that's already been kind of worked out in that Persian uh, um, Renaissance. This very crude kind of mapping is what you see on coins that were minted in this period, where uh, you have a statement of the credo of Islam, there is no God but, uh, but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, and then the name of the caliph will be on one side of the coin, the sultan will be on the other side of the coin, and the, the son of the sultan is oftentimes as well on that coin. So you have this kind of downward flow of authority uh, that has become already established in the way coinage was, was made uh, by the 13th century. But when the first Turks actually conquer North India, I'm, I'm going to show some coins here to illustrate again this theme of accommodation. I mentioned already how Muhammad bin Qasim ruled that Hindus and Buddhists of Sindh were people of the book. That's basically coming, reckoning with the reality uh, that um, we, we need to accommodate ourselves to this, this large non-Muslim population. So what do we do? We call them people in the book. When the first Turkish conquerors take North India, they basically take over the existing format of coinage. So here are Indian coins that go back to the mid-1700s uh, under the Hindu Shahi dynasty, where you have on one side a horseman on the left, with a spear in his hand, and on the other side of the coin you have a bull. So you have this bull and horseman established a formula of coinage by Hindu dynasties that had been already been around for, for hundreds of years before the Turks arrived. The first coins of Muhammad of Ghor, who's the first ruler of India, follows exactly the same format. You'll notice there's no Arabic, no Persian. What you have is a uh, a, a horseman on the left and a bull on the right. Uh, an extraordinary example of how uh, the, the Turkish rulers are of necessity having to accommodate themselves to the existing reality. That bankers, money lenders, will only accept coins which they recognize. If you throw a, a, a coin at them with, with Arabic on it, which nobody can read anyway uh, at this early stage, it's not going to be accepted. So what you do is you mint coins which will be accepted. The point I'm trying to make is that Muslim rulers, again, were having to, uh, to adjust themselves to this reality. Uh, here is another coin, a Rajput coin. The Chohana Rajputs were the last great Indian dynasty of North India uh, uh, before Turks conquered them. And their coins had on one side this image of the goddess Lakshmi, a famous goddess of wealth, uh, and, and you see her there, uh, uh, the kind of Indian beauty of the, of the 12th century on the left, and on the right uh, you have the name of the, the Chohana Rajputs in Devanagari script, the Indian script. And then what happens uh, when Muhammad of Agora shows up? Behold, all that you've heard about, you know, Muslims not having images on their, on their coins, Forget that. <laughs> this is reality. We, we are accommodating to the reality. We need to have coins which the Indian bankers will accept. We need to have coins that uh, they're already familiar. Otherwise, uh, what are we doing here? So Muhammad of course starts minting coins with Lakshmi on the one side and with his name in Sanskrit, Devanagari script on the opposite side. Uh, pragmatism is overcoming ideology, quite obviously. Uh, and yet, look at this double game that Muhammad of Gore uh, the first Turkish ruler of North India uh, is playing. He's ruling both Afghanistan and North India. The coins that are minted for circulation in Afghanistan follow the traditional classic Arabic formula. 
and you'll find this, this would have circulated anywhere in the Muslim world. And it has all the formula I talked about earlier, where you have God, Caliph, Sultan, son of Sultan, the downward authority, all in Arabic. There's no imagery, no images, nothing like that at all. But the same Sultan at the same time is minting these coins in India. So I, I think this is a, a, a fascinating point uh, illustrating this whole idea of, of the need to accommodate uh, politically with this reality. Uh, the Turks were uh, ruling this area in North India in the uh, in the uh, 13th century, this is more or less what the extent of their rule. But you can see they swept very qu quickly down the Gangetic Plain, uh, knocking over these, these uh, Rajput houses, the Chandalas, the Paramaras, and so forth uh, in, in, uh, in central and northern India. And then they establish the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate was the first uh, ruling house uh, of North India. And you can see in these, this map uh, the territorial extent under the founder, uh, Muhammad of Ghor, and his slave uh, successor, Ibek. Uh, his name is up there at the very top. Rules this, very, this, this heartland of Upper India. Uh, and then his successor, Iltutmash, another Turk, another Turkish slave, actually, uh, is, is, takes this much larger area. So this North India becomes the, the heartland of uh, Muslim rule. Uh, in by the 13th century when the Delhi Sultanate is established. Architecturally we begin to see uh, spectacular monuments. This is a minaret. It's often been thought of as kind of a victory tower because obviously if a muazzin is doing his call to the prayer at the top of this thing, nobody's going to hear him. This is before microphones <laughs> uh, and loudspeakers. Uh, and so it's oftentimes thought this is really a, uh, all art historians dispute exactly what this tower was all about. It's clearly a statement though of occupation. Uh, nothing like this had existed in India prior to the, to the Turkish arrival. And this is the very first architectural Muslim, Indo-Muslim monument in India, the, the great Qutub Minar. It's still the tallest minaret, I believe, in the world. Uh, extraordinary monument in, in, as part of this mosque uh, complex. Here's a close-up of it. Uh, you can see uh, juxtaposing uh, white marble with red sandstone. Uh, and and, and the, the writing on it is not only Arabic, but also Devanagari. Uh, Indian workmen made this. They used local workmen and we actually find on this tower invocations not to Allah, uh, not only to Allah, but also to the, the patron god of uh, craftsmen uh, among the Hindus. So it's a remarkable kind of monument. It's not just to Islam, but also uh, to, the, to, to the workmen who were, who were building it. Um, it was made of recycled columns from either Jain or Hindu temples stacked end on end to give them greater height. You can see there's one column here and then a second one is stacked above it. So you have these large, very high um, enclosures for prayer halls uh, in this mosque. And, uh, <clears throat> but behind all this is the larger story that I want to just, br br just briefly touch on is the Mongols were really the force that were pushing all this process in India. The Mongols, of course, have swept across from China in the 13th century. Um, of course, they succeed in conquering China. They never conquer India. Uh, they can't get beyond the, the, the Hindu Kush uh, area. Now, that's important. Genghis Khan himself uh, was knocking at the door of India in uh, 1221 uh, or 1231 when he was there, uh, but didn't make it through. The fact that the Mongols were unable to conquer India meant that India became understood by all these migrants who were pushed out of Central Asia, fleeing the Mongol terror. They began to see India as the true heartland of Islam, especially after the Mongols proceeded to demolish Baghdad and overthrow the caliph, indeed abolish the caliphate. So with, and of course that was, would be tantamount to having Rome uh, totally destroyed by the Vandals, which of course partially did happen, uh, but, uh, and, and, and Christianity thereby understood as uh, uh, w literally wiped off the map. So for these people who are fleeing the Mongols, India became a refuge zone. Uh, for them, pagan did not really mean Hindu, it meant Mongol. 
and all the rhetoric in early Indo-Muslim uh, literature of the 13th and 14th century uh, really is inspired by that fact. That is, the Mongols, who are the true, uh, 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 who, 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 are, who are the pagans, who are the infidels, the Kafirs. Um, so India then becomes an area, uh, as I said earlier, of, of filling up uh, through these, uh, following these migration corridors, uh, large numbers of people uh, fleeing to North India. And the Delhi Sultanate uh, becomes, at least in North India, uh, well established by the 13th and 14th century, lasts all the way down to the mid to the early 16th century. The Deccan in the south is never conquered. It's conquered, but they can't hold it. So there's this, this long divide between North India and the Deccan uh, that, uh, that exists. But behind all that, uh, underlined in red, are the Mongols, uh, who, as I said earlier, do not succeed in conquering India, uh, but they, they have driven all this, this Persianized Turkish population into South Asia, who now begin to s see India as the, the true home of Islam, given the fact that Baghdad has been destroyed in 1258, uh, the caliph has been executed, uh, the office has been abolished. And so the Sultan of India becomes the focus of many pious Muslims who are now looking for spiritual direction, even though the Sultan uh, doesn't have a spiritual bone in his body. Uh, most of these guys are, are Turkish slaves uh, who have no genealogical connection with, with aristocracy or whatever, uh, yet they're built up by their ideologues, by their, 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 uh, uh, their propagandists as these, 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 these focus of, of Muslims. Um, as I said, briefly, South India was conquered, at least down pretty far south. Uh, two capitals were established in the, in the 14th century in Delhi and also in Doladabad. Here's Delhi. Uh, this is 13th century Delhi, which still, still looks like this today. These are the ramparts of, of what they call Tulukabad. Uh, and Delhi now becomes identified as the capital of India. Um, from this point on, any dynasty that has pretensions of ruling India has to control Delhi. This is true all the way down to the 20th century. When the British needed to establish themselves as the natural rulers of India, they moved their capital in 1911 from Calcutta to New Delhi. They did the same thing that Muslim dynasties had been doing for the previous millennium, uh, <clears throat> building another city of Delhi, uh, not occupying the same palaces that the predecessors had done, but palaces nearby, or building new palaces, uh, so there's another Delhi in, in the region. That's Tulukabad. And in the south, in the Deccan, Dolatabad was this co-capital uh, that, the, that the sultans built and ruled from there as well. Uh, here is the, the great mosque in Dolatabad. Uh, the same idea, stacking uh, Hindu temples end on end, Hindu columns, I should say, end on end to gr give greater height to the prayer hall. Here you see exactly what I just described uh, in, in the south. But there's a, there's a memory of the North India. Uh, here we have the corner of the Dolatabad Mosque uh, in, in the south, and it, it, it is kind of a, a visual reminder of the Qutub Minar in Delhi. So that these migrants, They've already migrated from Central Asia to North India. Now they're migrating from North India to the South, but they're carrying with them this reminder of North India, that the, the Qutub Minar has kind of become the icon of Indo-Muslim in, Indo presence. Uh, and we see that echoed in this corner, engaged corner tower uh, in, in the Dolatabad Mosque. So here's our, here's our migration corridor that I mentioned earlier, uh, following those ancient trade routes, uh, horse trade routes uh, from Central Asia into South Asia. Moving on down to Bijapur, uh, we see monuments that are built, uh, carrying with them a Central Asian uh, visual aesthetic. You see, you see domes, you see minarets, you see arches, pointed arches. Uh, these become the elements, kind of the architectural vocabulary uh, of, of mosque building in the 16th century uh, when this Deccan Sultanate down there uh, is established. And then from Bijapur, uh, if we look at Kerala, which is off the roots, now we're talking about uh, coastal, Malabar coast. This was not settled by 
migrants coming from the north uh, along those migration corridors. Kerala Muslims are Muslims who had sailed across on those Arab dhows. And they have a very different sensibility. Their, their connection is not with North India. It's not with Turkish or Persian culture. Uh, they don't speak Urdu or, or any of the North Indian languages. They speak Malayalam, uh, which is the native language of, of the Malabar coast. And what's striking is that when we look at their architecture, you do not find uh, arches, pointed arches. You do not find domes uh, or minarets. Uh, of the kind of standard vocabulary of North India, uh, but rather you find these wooden roof uh, uh, kind of layers like a wedding cake, uh, which in fact imitates the same vocabulary of Hindu temples. So you notice here what's happening. Another theme of accommodation. Once you move off that corridor, that migration corridor, and look at Kerala, you see that Islam has accommodated itself visually and architecturally with the local culture. That's a very important theme. Uh, because we begin to understand now that Islam is extremely flexible in terms of how it accommodates itself to indigenous cultures in South Asia. And this is something you can, oh, question, please. Just if we could get the name of the previous. Uh... The previous slide, yeah, this is the, the Mishkal Mosque built in 1510. It's been rebuilt uh, many, uh, uh, but this is a basic design of it, and, and Calicut. Now Calicut is a city on the coast, the Malabar coast. This is where Vasco da Gama arrives, when Europeans first connect Europe <coughs> through maritime routes uh, in 1498 is when Vasco da Gama succeeds in doing what Christopher Columbus failed to do, which is to reach India. <laughs> uh, six years later he does it, of course. And uh, Calicut is a major center of the pepper trade. And this was where, uh, and cardamom, and all these spices of South India uh, were flowing out into the Indian Ocean world through the port of Calicut. Uh, it was a major metropolis. And uh, this is the great mosque of Calicut. And as I said, uh, this is their, the, 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 the architecture basically is using the same vocabulary that was already familiar to the people of Kerala. Uh, if we talk about, never mind Kerala, let's go to Bengal. Now, Bengal is also an area that's very far from these routes, uh, these migration corridor. Uh, now we're at the, the very end of this this Indo-Gangetic Plain in far eastern India. And what we find here is mosques appearing uh, with distinctive characteristics. You have terracotta uh, panels on, on, the, on the walls. You have a, a, a curved cornice, uh, which is the classic design of the, uh, the Bengali uh, village hut. Our word bungalow is derived from the word Bengal which is the Bengal style, which is a curve made of thatched and, and bamboo. Uh, it's, it's curved so that rain, the monsoon rain, which is very high in, in Bengal, uh, will, 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 will drain off. So this idea of a curved cornice is a very Bengali phenomenon, uh, as well as the, the terracotta panels uh, on the front. It's all brick. Uh, there's no marble uh, or granite or hard stone in Bengal. You build everything of brick. And what's extraordinary about this monument is if we compare it with temples of Bengal, lo and behold, we find the same uh, architectural vocabulary. We have terracotta uh, panels on the front. We have the curved cornice, uh, which is derived, again, from this kind of uh, vernacular vocabulary of village Bengal. And uh, so that in, in Bengal, as in Kerala, what we see is that that the form in which the mosque appears is thoroughly invested in local culture. Uh, the Bengalis have borrowed from the uh, Bengali vocabulary. Bengali Muslims are using the same vocabulary in eastern India. Uh, and again, in Kerala, uh, the same kind of thing operates for there. I could make the same statement about the Tamil area in, in the southeast coast, uh, in Orissa. Uh, the point is that when, to, when we move away from this kind of central, this, this migration corridor going down the spine of South Asia, uh, then we see much more accommodation to indigenous culture. Um, Tamerlane invades India in 1398-99. Uh, um, 
He dies in 1405. Uh, he does not stay to rule uh, India, but he, his base is at Samarkand, uh, uh, Timor is. But he shakes up North India in the sense that he destroys Delhi. Delhi had been the capital of, of, uh, of North India, the successive dynasties, the Delhi Sultanate for, for several centuries. And now what happens after, after Tamerlane is that North India becomes, um, it loses its focus. Delhi is no longer the, the center of, uh, of uh, Indian, Indo-Muslim polity. And he brings with him a Central Asian sensibility. Here we have the, the tomb of, 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 of Timur himself in Samarkand. Uh, you see all these very extraordinary elements, high drums, uh, vaulting techniques that, that allow you to, to, to soar up to the sky. This is all new uh, ideas. Uh, glazed tile covered all over the surfaces of, of Central Asian uh, mosques. Uh, and they're freestanding, and the overall effect then is to, is to, is to be able to be seen from afar. I mean, Timur himself uh, introduces into Islamic architecture uh, this idea of uh, kind of over-the-top, uh, extravagant uh, uh, visual statements uh, that you see. And all of this is carried into India uh, by the next great conqueror of North India, um, these, this, this kind of glazed tile techniques, which of course is Babur, B-A-B-U-R, uh, Babur, uh, and you can see from this painting, this is not Babur, but this is his fam the family in the early 16th century, it's very Central Asian. You can just see from the facial characteristics that these are not Indians. Uh, these are uh, people who have already, who have come from Central Asia. But a very cosmopolitan uh, Central Asian style is brought to North India uh, by Babur, who's depicted here uh, founding a garden. Uh, it says in Persian that he's establishing, uh, he's planting, he's directing the planting of pomegranates uh, in, in his garden. So we begin to get now, uh, with 1526, uh, Babur, uh, sweeps away the last dynasty of Delhi sultans in North India and establishes the Mughal Empire, which is the largest Muslim empire in the world, uh, larger even than the Ottomans or the Safavids in, in, in the Middle East, although the three were roughly contemporary. Uh, and I'm sure you've already been hearing a lot and reading a lot about the Safavids and the Ottomans. So Babur brings to South Asia a similar uh, Central Asian aesthetic, a similar Central Asian uh, sensibility, uh, idea of politics, idea of power, uh, is all established uh, during his reign. 1526 to 1605, you can see how the Mughals are repeating what the Delhi Sultans had done several centuries earlier. Take over the central heartland of North India and then move out and conquer uh, Gujarat in the west, Bengal in the east. And <clears throat> what's extraordinary about the Mughals is that, that not Babur, but his grandson, Akbar, uh, in order to rule North India, he departs from the policy of, of earlier uh, rulers, which was to always keep the Rajputs at arm's length, try to conquer the Rajputs. The Rajputs were the, the Hindu ruling class of North India before the, the Turks arrived. What Akbar does is he engages with the Rajputs, uh, he brings them into the ruling class, and he marries Rajput uh, princesses, which is very important because it means that biologically each successive generation of the Mughal ruling house is less and less Turkic and more and more Indian. You look at the facial characteristics of the Rajputs, now here we have Jahangir, who is the son of, of Akbar. Um, <coughs> Uh, Akbar was, was a, of pure Turco-Persian -Pers blood, but Akbar's uh, wife was a pure Rajput princess who was brought into the Mughal harem. And <clears throat> so that means that Jahangir is biologically half Rajput. Jahangir, in turn, marries other Rajput women, princesses, 
Of course, these are all political marriages, much like Europe knew at roughly the same time. Uh, uh, I mean, that's how you cement uh, political relationships. You, 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 you marry into the same families. It's exactly what's happening now with the Mughals. And I, I would argue that this is extremely significant because it means that, that just as Jahangir was one half Rajput, his son, Shah Jahan, builder of the Taj Mahal, is, only, is, is three quarters Rajput because Jahangir is also married a Rajput woman. So that the element of Turkic biological uh, content of the ruling Mughal house is becoming progressively less Turkic and more Rajput, more Indian. They don't even use Turkish language anymore. They've forgotten that. Uh, Persian is still patronized as the language of, of uh, rulership. But in, at home, they're speaking uh, what we would now recognize as Hindi, or Hindi Urdu. It's the same thing, it's a different script, but the, the point is that the, what was known as Hindavi, or the local Indian language, was now assimilated into the court. So that the Mughals, uh, we can call them Muslim, but really they are becoming North Indian. Uh, they, it's another example of accommodation to uh, North Indian culture. And uh, uh, his son, Jahangir's son, Shah Jahan, uh, builds, of course, uh, the most spectacular monuments that are familiar to, to many of us, uh, and any visitor to India. I mean, this is the most extraordinary building in New Delhi, in Old Delhi, I should say. Shah Jahanabad means the city of Shah Jahan, king of the world. <laughs> um, and this is, of course, the building from which Jawaharlal Nehru uh, read off the, the, the Declaration of, of Independence for <laughs> India in August of 1947, uh, standing up there at the top. So this has become, again, the symbol of Indian rulership. I mean, Delhi had always, as I mentioned earlier, been the, the center of, of, of uh, Muslim power um, in India. And, uh, and now it's interesting, that even though the British had already built New Delhi, only five miles away from this monument. Uh, Nehru is announcing the, the proclamation of independent India from this monument, meaning he's identifying himself not with the British, but with the Mughals, uh, who had already become Indian, uh, where the British never did, of course, uh, in, in ways the British couldn't do. So Shah Jahan, then, is the patron of these monuments which we all identify uh, as kind of the classic statement of, 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 of India itself, the icon of India. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a, a perfect transplant of Iranian architecture. Again, Delhi is on that, and this is Agra, of course, just 100 miles southeast of Delhi, but it's on that corridor. That, that corridor of, of Persian architecture, that migration corridor from Central Asia uh, into the heart of India. So we, hear, we see here an exact replica of the finest Persian aesthetic uh, reflected in the Taj Mahal. But not just the Taj Mahal, but other great monuments uh, of the north, the Great Mosque in Lahore. Uh, again, sandstone and white marble, red sandstone. Uh, in, in the south of the Deccan, we get uh, Timurid, or Central Asian uh, motifs again, the glazed tile. You see here the glazed tile, uh, the, 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 fall, the, the minarets are really, this could appear anywhere in Central Asia. Again, these are essentially transplants from Central Asia into India, unlike those Bengali or Kerala uh, mosques that I showed earlier. Sufism, I know you've read a lot about that. Because this goes back to the question of how Islam accommodates itself to India. The Quran, here's a central paradox. The Quran, you know, you know was written in Arabic. In fact, there's a famous ayah in, 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 or statement in the Quran where Allah says, we have created an Arabic Quran so that you might understand. The assumption behind that statement is that the Quran is addressing an Arabic-speaking population. And of course, for centuries and centuries, there was a kind of a prohibition against translating the Quran out of Arabic into any other language. So the question becomes, and we go back to the central paradox, how does India, where Arabic is not spoken, how does the Quran communicate? How is the Quran mediated to a non-Arabic speaking population? 
And I want to close with this, this, these the few comments here about uh, how that paradox is overcome. Because uh, it, it really goes to the heart, I think, of understanding Islam in, in, in South Asia. How does Islam, how, why is it that South Asia is, the, is the, the demographic heartland of the Islamic religion? Not Middle East, but South Asia. When this is a non-Arabic speaking area. That's the central paradox. One of the answers is that whereas the Bible, of course, is freely translated out of Hebrew and Greek into Latin, uh, into all the vernacular languages uh, with, with the Reformation, this does not happen with the Quran. Uh, so we need to redefine our understanding of translation. We do not find a word by, well, translation is not just a word by word uh, uh, translation of meaning from Arabic into other languages. Rather, the word translation needs to be understood in a much broader kind of uh, metaphorical sense. You have commentaries of the Quran, which are written in vernacular languages. You have histories of the Prophet Muhammad and the other prophets of the Quran written in vernacular languages. And it's these Bengali or Tamil or Kashmiri commentaries on the Quran or histories of the prophets. These are written in local languages and each one of these becomes a, a way of transmitting Islamic ideas into vernacular culture. So even though the Quran it's not translated word by word into vernacular Bengali or Hindi or Kannada or Telugu or any of the other languages. It is through other media uh, that Islamic ideas are, are mediated into a non-Arabic speaking people. One mechanism is through the great Sufi shrines that are built uh, in the Punjab. Now this is in Multan, uh, now in Pakistan. Uh, in, in the great province of Punjab. The sultans uh, in the 14th century of Delhi would patronize popular Sufi sheikhs for simple political reasons. These Sufi sheikhs are already popular. Uh, their shrines are, are great kind of like magnets attracting uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of people, both Hindus and, uh, and Muslims. So what the Sultan does, in order to kind of curry the favor of local populations, is to build these magnificent monuments over the grave sites of very popular sheikhs. You know, it's like American politicians going to Hollywood <laughs> and incurring the favor of movie stars. Uh, you need to, to, to sink your roots in the local population. You identify who are the people that are locally understood as charismatic and powerful. We're going to get on their side. So as a political statement, what the sultans of Delhi are doing is by patronizing these great Sufi shrines uh, in, in, uh, in Western India, they are plugging into an existing uh, uh, network of piety. Uh, namely Sufism. And so throughout present-day Pakistan, we find these extraordinary monuments. I mean, uh, look at the tile. Uh, again, it all echoes Central Asian aesthetic that, that, that I already showed. You can see that reflected here very clearly. Uh, but look at the, also what you see here. These are all graves of people who want to be buried near the site where this particular sheikh uh, was, was buried which is, of course, the, the heart of the, of the whole monument. So in Western India, you, what you have is a phenomenon of these great shrines uh, that are kind of like magnets, uh, patronized by sultans. They're the ones who, pay, who write the, the checkbook. Uh, they support it. They, 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 they pay the bills. Uh, and so you have this kind of connection between local piety and political power. Uh, it's visually very dramatically seen in these, these shrines. Uh, these are shrines of the Deccan, same idea. Uh, the sultans would have patronized these, these monuments. Uh, in, uh, again, in the Punjab, you have these, these, these large shrines made of pure marble, again, patronized by the sultans of Delhi. Uh, here is a nighttime celebration at one of these, these shrines. And I'm, I'm, you've already studied Sufism. You understand that you know, these are the, every Thursday night is when you have these large gatherings at, uh, at the shrines of, uh, in the Punjab. Uh, this particular one at Pak Patan. Here's the grave site uh, of one of these shrines. Uh, Muslims saying prayers over them. 
Uh, here is another sh uh, the, the tomb of, of, of a Shah in, in, uh, in Sindh. And I just want to draw your attention to one thing about this, uh, which is the, the presence of, of this object here, which of course you can easily recognize as a crown. The crown symbolizes the fact that in Sufi thought, the real sovereigns of the world are Sufi sheikhs who simply kind of designate sultans to be their caretakers uh, who do the messy business of revenue collection, administering justice, raising armies, taxation, they do all that. But the real sovereigns of the universe are Sufis who quote unquote appoint the sultans to, to rulership. And so there's this fascinating kind of tense relationship between uh, political power, sultans, and Sufi sheikhs. They both claim sovereignty, but in different ways. Uh, the sultans are out there fighting their, their, their battles, collecting taxes, and all the rest of it. Uh, but they also used Sufis many times to serve as the, in, in their coronation ceremonies, it's Sufi sheikhs who actually put the crown on their head. Because it's understood in the Sufi discourse that Sufis are the real sovereigns of the world. And you see that echoed here in this tomb where we have, a, uh, we have a, a, an actual crown. And of course, many Sufis bear the name Shah, which means king uh, in Persian. Uh, this particular one, Shah Mardan Shah. He's got the word twice in there. Uh, <laughs> king. Shahin Shah, king of kings. Uh, <clears throat> so th th there is that connection. So we go back to this. This, this map, which I began with. And I want to simply make one quick point about, tr again, trying to explain why it is that the eastern Bengal and, and the western uh, Punjab are the areas where we have the predominant Muslim population. If we look at a distribution of Muslims in Bengal as of the first census, 1872, we can see it is the eastern half which has the highest population, up, up 70, 80 percent, as high as 90 and above uh, in, the, in the eastern delta. Whereas the western delta, which is where the Calcutta is, is, is the western side, uh, it's mainly Hindu. And if we look at the distribution of mosques, on the other hand, they're all over the delta, but the real heartland is in the west, along the old Gangetic the Ganges River, somewhat more sparse in the east. So you have this kind of paradox where the predominant Muslim population is in the east, but the majority of the mosques are in the west. Now my own research was really uh, trying to understand how do you resolve that apparent uh, contradiction. What I found in, squirreled away in, in record rooms in, uh, in what is now Bangladesh, eastern Bengal, were these 17th and 16th century Persian records which basically transferred virgin jungle land, forested, thick forested land, to developers who were required to cut the jungle, bring the land into cultivation, rice cultivation, wet rice, and as a condition for doing that, uh, they had to build either a temple or a mosque, which then became the kind of nucleus of, of new communities in a, in a region where uh, the, the population was neither Hindu nor Muslim already. They, they were uh, practicing kind of uh, local Bengali religious cults in the 16th and 17th centuries. These, mod these documents, of which I, I found hundreds of them, speak to the gradual transformation of land from jungle to rice paddy because they would actually have pictures of these Bengali mosques. And again, you see the curved cornice. Now, this is not some spectacular monument uh, that would have appeared in, in inscriptions somewhere. They're made of bamboo and thatching, very simple. But they performed a very important role as being kind of the nucleus of new communities, because there would be a muazzin uh, and the, the leader of prayer, uh, a khatib who, who delivers the sermon. Uh, and all this was paid for by the developer who got the grant who was given the land uh, and as a condition for getting rent-free land, uh, he had to build these mosques or temples. But if a developer happened to be a Muslim, uh, it would be a mosque like this or, or like that. <clears throat> so that you can see beginning in the 1720s, the distribution of these, they gradually increase. Uh, the, each dot indicates where one of these mosques was built. 
and they get thicker as we move into the 1740s and 1750s, uh, where it's quite dense. This really is the story of the growth of, uh, of Islam in Bengal. This particular series of maps are based on contemporary European maps of Bengal. The point of it being that if we look closely, the first map <coughs> drawn by a Portuguese cartographer shows, if I can do it, here we go, the Ganges emptying down by present-day Calcutta. Satgaon is here. So the, the, the Ganges River basically flowed in the western part of the delta. By uh, 1615, it splits. Half of it goes down the west, and the other half goes into the eastern delta. By 1760, it's abandoned its old channel down by Satgaon, which is Calcutta here, and the major part of it is going into the central delta. By 1779, uh, the, the Ganges has linked up with the great Brahmaputra, which goes through East Bengal. The point being that the river system of Bengal has moved from the west to the east. The center, the epicenter of civilization moves with the rivers. Uh, and Calcutta and the western, the old part, becomes uh, progressively abandoned. Now, Calcutta is today a dying city because the old Ganges River has basically abandoned it. Whereas the eastern delta gets more and more fertile because it's getting more and more fresh water. Now this is important because the, <coughs> the area is politically integrated with the Mughals at the same time that these rivers are shifting to the east, meaning that East Bengal becomes the area of uh, agricultural as well as political development. A question, please. What was the, what, what is, what's the influence of people's use of the land around where the river flowed to influence the rivers move east? <clears throat> okay. Is the question, why are they moving east? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a geological question. And the, and, and the geologists uh, have two theories. And I'm not going to get into that. I have no dog in this fight. One theory is, uh, is tectonic. Th that there's, there is a, <coughs> there's a fault line geologically in the east, which is gradually causing the eastern side of Bengal to cave to the this way for you, cave downward, uh, you know, having to do with continental uh, uh, drift. Uh, and that, that's one theory. And the other theory is that all of Bengal basically is a flat pancake. It's, it's the whole Bangladesh today is about 30, 40 feet above sea level. And, and, uh, and so all what these rivers are doing are building, building, bringing silt down into the Bengal Delta. The whole area is basically silt that's been transfer, transferred from the Himalaya Mountains. Uh, Topsoil gets moved down to this area. So it's very rich because the Ganges and the Meghna and the Brahmaputra, all these rivers are bringing huge loads of silt down. And the, 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 as a consequence, the Delta keeps getting pushed further and further south uh, into the Bay of Bengal. This whole area, therefore, is remarkably fertile because of, the, because of what the rivers are doing. So as the rivers move to the east, the east becomes progressively more fertile and the west becomes less fertile. That's reflected in population figures. Population is, is higher in the east than it is in the west. And this is also reflected in the pattern of, of uh, development of, uh, of, of villages. So these records I showed you, these Persian manuscripts, which documents, which what, the, what they're really showing you is that the land is being transformed from jungle to rice paddy. And that means that uh, and rice paddy supports a lot more people than jungle can, uh, obviously. So all this is happening at the same time that there's an agrarian transformation at the same time that people are being introduced for the first time to a world religion. That Islam is identified with forest development. And one of the things that's unique about Sufism in eastern Bengal is that Sufis are typically identified with not just preaching Islam, but with preaching agriculture. They're identified with the people who first brought the, the, the technology of rice cultivation to the East. So the, no, the Muslims of uh, notions of Islamic piety today are associated with agriculture. You talk to peasants in Bangladesh and they will say that we peasants are the true Muslims because we're doing what God told uh, uh, Abraham to, told Adam to do, that Adam was instructed to take the plow and to master the earth by plowing the earth. Whereas those folks in the city who are not plowing the land 
are not really as good Muslims as we are. So they've internalized this idea, this connection between agriculture and Islamic religion in ways that are fascinating because many textbooks you read about Islam repeat this old idea that Islam is somehow of an urban religion. You know, it's a Middle Eastern idea. It might work for Baghdad, you know, and Damascus and the, all the, the famous centers of Islam in the Middle East. Uh, but when you move into the Indian subcontinent, which is monsoon, uh, there the whole thing is inverted. And that, that Islam is now understood as an agrarian uh, phenomenon. And these saints, these Sufis, are associated with people who, who bring uh, uh, Islamic piety to Bengal. So I'll close with this image. The Punjab was settled again primarily by transplanted uh, uh, Persianized Turks who have been pushed out of Central Asia by the Mongols and they bring with them a very Central Asian aesthetic sensibility. So that the sultans who are ruling from Delhi will patronize monuments which could easily have appeared in Central Asia, in Samarkand, in Bukhara, uh, any of the great cities of Central Asia. Uh, here you have these powerful Sufi sheikhs who are loaded with baraka or charisma, who are seen as kind of conduits between us humans and Allah. And so people want to be buried there. Uh, they go there on pilgrimage. They, they, they have hugely important uh, uh, festivals that take place at these, these great shrines uh, in, in the Punjab. And so these, these become the magnets uh, for local populations of, uh, of people who are not yet Hindu. Um, uh, they're kind of on the way to becoming Hindu, but they're not quite there yet in the 12th century. And uh, the, the, and so the Punjab has a very different kind of uh, entree into Islam than Bengal. In Bengal, you don't have these great monuments. What you have are simple, thatched, uh, and bamboo huts, which become the earliest mosques. Uh, as I've tried to suggest, we see that already in those documents uh, earlier on. And those uh, are the kind of important uh, uh, ways in which Islam is mediated to a very different population in, in Bengal from Punjab. One of the reasons that Pakistan broke up in 1971, you know, in 1947 you have two wings, a, a west and an east. Even though Bengal is more populated than than uh, than West Pakistan, uh, East Pakistan was uh, was always looked down upon as not really being Muslim. Uh, these these Bengalis they ate fish uh, and rice uh, in, instead of uh, wheat and meat, like us Punjabis. Uh, and and we, we see the aesthetic style of of, ben, of Bengal and Punjab also very different. So Bengal breaks away from Pakistan in 1971 and establishes Bangladesh because Islam no longer was understood as a sufficient glue holding together these two separate provinces of, of the state. Uh, and I would argue, as you can see here reflected in architecture, that the whole sensibility of Bengali Muslims and Punjabi Muslims is very different uh, as, as, as understood in terms of, of how they relate to their sheikhs uh, and, and their mosques. Now, I know that we're getting late on time, Sam, so I, I wanted to... We, we, have, we can take a little, we have a 20 minute break, so we can cut into it a little bit. Yeah. So we can take maybe 15 minutes to find Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. Is that, and this is kind of gives a, a, an overall kind of um, introduction to the whole story, kind of historical background. And uh, why don't we do that? Why don't we take questions, and, and I'd be happy to kind of start this discussion.